welcome to episode 4 in my Piano 2 Orchestra series. In this episode, I'll demonstrate my process for adding the harp to my orchestral music using six different excerpts that I've composed. I'll look at the first three excerpts in part one, which is this video, and then I'll look at the last three excerpts in part two. Before I begin, I want to mention that you can get the MIDI, Music XML, Dorico files, Cubase file, and individual instrumental audio stems for all of the music demonstrated in this video, as well as previous and future videos, by supporting me on Patreon. In fact, I recently reached my first Patreon goal, which allowed me to purchase the Berlin Symphonic Harps sample library, which is featured in today's video. Also, if you're interested in improving your orchestration or composition skills, you can sign up for the highest tier on my Patreon page, which will give you access to all of the piano excerpts for these types of videos well in advance, so that you can orchestrate them yourself. You can then submit your work to me, and I'll share my thoughts and offer a bunch of suggestions and comments. For this video, I even wrote up a document outlining some suggestions and things to consider when orchestrating each excerpt. I really think this is a great way to practice and improve on your skills. And thanks so much to all of my current patrons. I am so grateful for your support. Okay, let's get started with today's video. As I said before, this one's all about using the harp effectively in your orchestrations. Throughout this video, I'll discuss some of the most common and effective roles for the harp, as well as things to keep in mind. Each of the following three excerpts offer slightly different orchestrational challenges, especially when it comes to using the harp effectively. So here's excerpt number one. With all of these examples, I'll keep two things in mind. First, I want to orchestrate this piano music effectively, maintaining the integrity of the original piano composition, while also taking advantage of the additional timbres and textures from an orchestra that can elevate the music to the next level. And secondly, for this particular video, I'll be thinking about how to effectively use the harp. That could be as a foreground or as a background instrument. But however I use it, I want its presence to be felt. And because the harp is such a delicate instrument most of the time, I need to be thinking about the overall density of my orchestrations so I don't overpower the harp. Before I play this excerpt, I think it's a good idea to try and extract individual parts from this piano score. This will help a lot when it comes time to orchestrate but it also makes following along with the score easier when listening. With this particular example, there are really never more than three things happening at once. There's a foreground melodic part, which I'll outline in red. There are just a few tricky moments where it's not clear which part is foreground. First, right here, you have to make a decision here whether the melodic foreground continues with the triplet notes or whether the phrase ends by settling on the B-flat quarter note. Obviously, I wrote this excerpt, so it's easy for me to say, but still, I think there's a better argument, musically speaking, to let the line come to more of a pause on the B-flat before starting back up in the next measure. That means that the triplet notes below are middle ground material that temporarily carries the motion. I'll return to this moment later when orchestrating. Another moment worth noting is right here. The melodic foreground from the previous measure clearly resolves by step to the G, but then in this measure, a temporary new line emerges to the foreground in the form of octave triplets. In fact, you can almost see how the background material from the previous measure takes over the foreground. It's very clear in the left hand how it ascends step by step to that moment. So this will be an interesting moment to orchestrate. I'll outline the middle ground material in blue. This is material that is more than just harmonic support. It typically has some sort of motion like quarter notes or eighth notes but orchestrationally, it needs to sit behind the foreground material in terms of motivic and textural importance. Other than those few moments that I mentioned, it's pretty clear which parts are middle ground. I can even divide the middle ground material into two different parts. There's this upper register line that enters twice and eventually joins in with the main motive. And there's also a low register eighth note line that enters in measure five. And so the rest of the notes are all background harmonic support. As you listen to this piano version, try and listen to the different parts and their respective roles within the music. <laughs> 
the first question is, how should you use the harp in this excerpt? My instinct is to have the harp more of a background instrument. This foreground motivic material would not suit the harp idiomatically, and upon first glance, perhaps these eighth notes in the middle ground might suit the harp better. To have its presence felt earlier in this excerpt, I'll have to add material for the harp that's not written in this piano version. For instance, something like a glissando. But I'll worry about the harp after I've taken care of the foreground material. Here's that same piano score, however I've separated the different parts into their own staves. I'll start by orchestrating the main motivic material. I'll focus on this first phrase, measures 1 through 4. Because of the register that it's in, as well as the dynamic markings and grace note ornaments, I think it's most suited for a woodwind instrument. This particular line would work well for flute, oboe, or clarinet. I'll give it to a solo flute, at least initially. If I were to keep it as a solo flute for the entire four measures, I would need to be extremely cautious with the middle and background elements, especially in measures three and four. A solo flute in this register, the middle of the treble clef staff, won't really be able to cut through an orchestral texture. Perhaps just a solo flute on the melody and a harp on the accompaniment would work well. However, I've chosen to make it slightly more orchestral. And so to support the melody in measures three and four, I bring in two additional flutes in unison. Here's what that sounds like. So focusing still on the first four measures, I'll turn my attention to this material here. I need a sustaining instrument, and I want to avoid woodwinds as it might draw attention away from the woodwind melody. I think violins would work as long as they are given very low dynamics. I chose to have violin ones muted and also divided in half in octaves. This way they won't get in the way of the flutes. Now looking at the supporting harmony notes, I chose to have the measure three material in clarinets and oboes underneath the melody. At a low dynamic, these instruments can stay out of the way of the three flutes. Now notice how the next measure jumps down in register quite a bit. Clarinets and oboes obviously can't go this low, so I'll need to bring in new instruments. But I don't want to suddenly remove the clarinets and oboes at the climax of the phrase, so I'll fill in the harmonies in the registral gap. Here's what that looks like in my orchestration, with two oboes and two clarinets on the A-flat and E-flat in measure 3 that resolves to B-flat and G in measure 4. I've added additional harmonic supporting notes in measure 4, built from that E-flat major chord with an added ninth. I bring in the rest of the string section for this chord, all con sordino. Lastly, I want to add harp. I mentioned adding a glissando earlier. I think I'll do just that. I can use the notes of the other three instruments in measure three. That's E flat, F, A flat, C, and D. I'll set the harp pedals accordingly, and I'll start the glissando in measure three by ascending for about two beats and then descending down to beat one of the next measure. So let's hear how these four measures sound all together. On to the next six measures. I won't spend quite as long discussing each part of the music here, but essentially I continue what I was doing with woodwinds on the melody and strings on the accompaniment. I begin measure five with two flutes plus two oboes in unison and an English horn 
a clarinet, and a bassoon in unison down the octave, all on the melody. Like before, I bring in the violins on this upper register material. Violins are joined by piccolo on the measure 7 triplet gesture. Meanwhile, I placed the low register eighth notes in harp, and in measure 7, a clarinet is added to this octave of the triplet gesture. I also have low strings on sustaining harmonies, essentially an A-flat major triad in first inversion that shares a register with the harp eighth notes. This brings us to the last three measures. I've been slowly increasing the overall texture in terms of adding instruments and increasing dynamics. So in measure eight, I want a much fuller texture. And considering the violins are already in that register, I keep them on the melody alongside flutes and clarinets. And I decided to also bring in violas down the octave and celli down two octaves. Keep in mind that these are all still muted. I have the strings and winds land on a fully orchestrated E flat major chord in the last measure. Once again, I have harp on the low register eighth notes. With a much thicker orchestral texture here, there's a chance harp will get swallowed up a bit, but I wasn't too worried about potentially losing these eighth notes. And lastly, I bring in horns on the sustaining harmonies alongside bassoons starting in measure eight. Let's hear these six measures. Okay, so I'll put the whole thing together and show the full score. The only thing that I didn't mention is that I added a vibraphone note in measures 2 and 6, punctuating the entrance of the violins. It really helps the sound of the strings emerge from the texture with a sort of bell-like sound. Okay, so here's the full version. Moving on to example two, let's hear the piano version first. Two main things I want to focus on with this one. First, do I want to maintain the alternating high and low register eighth note configuration as it is in the piano? Or is that simply a pianistic texture that when orchestrated verbatim wouldn't be as effective? If that's the case, I might just have the low and high register parts on constant eighth notes, like I'm showing here in the first five measures. I think this question is directly related to the next thing I want to focus on, which is density. In this piano version, I mark the starting dynamic as piano, but from there on, there are just crescendos and diminuendos no indication of how loud to crescendo to. That allows the orchestrator some freedom in just how big of a sound he or she wants. And depending on the number of instruments and density, I think the decision to have alternating high and low register eighth notes versus constant eighths becomes very important. With just a few instruments, specifically instruments like the piano, so that would be harp, mallet, percussion, things like that, I'm much more inclined to have the alternating high and low eighth notes. With these types of instruments, I can maintain that playful, more delicate syncopation without increasing the intensity of the articulation and especially sacrificing rhythmic integrity. I've made a few different orchestrations of this excerpt, starting with a version using just a few instruments. I have harp and marimba on the eighth notes. Marimba can be played with up to four mallets depending on the difficulty of the music, but here I stick to only three mallets, or three notes, while harp has more or less the same music from the original piano version. Here's what they sound like paired together. I have piano and celeste doubling on the top notes of every chord change, 
Plus, I've separated the eighth notes from the quarter note triplets so that the piano and celesta are the only instruments on the quarter note triplets. Here's what they sound like added in. Lastly, I have saltosto strings on sustaining long notes that occupy the same register as the original piano notes. They really help to warm up the overall timbre, and the low strings support the harp in the low register. Also, the violins double on the descending melodic gesture in measure 8. Overall, this is a very thin orchestration, but I maintain that delicate back-and-forth eighth note concept that was a main component of the piano version. So let's give this a listen. In my second orchestration of this excerpt, I chose to translate the eighth note pulsating piano rhythms into constant sixteenth note measured tremolos in these strings. As I was discussing earlier, if I were to have the syncopated eighths back and forth in high and low strings, I would run the risk of sounding too jagged and more intense than I would like. That's not to say it would be impossible, but I think the easier solution is to have a more uniform string pulse. I chose sixteenth notes instead of eighth notes to heighten the sense of forward momentum. I also have double bass pizzicatos punctuating the chord changes. Just FYI, the MIDI data shows sustains here, as I was using a measured tremolo patch instead of individual short articulation notes. Here's how the strings sound alone. Next, I'll add in the percussion, piano, and harp. The harp has essentially the same part as in the first orchestration, so does the piano. Instead of celesta, I now have vibraphone and glockenspiel filling a similar timbral role, and I've removed marimba from the texture. In addition to the pitched percussion, I have a suspended cymbal playing soft single notes in measure 1, 4, and 6, as well as a rolled crescendo at the end. Similarly, I have timpani, roll, and crescendo on the note C in the last measure. As you can see, I've basically copied what I did in the first version, but shifted things around just a bit, keeping in mind what will sound well in a slightly larger orchestration. It's all about balance. I added more density in the strings, so I balanced that by changing the density of the percussion, and the timpani and cymbals will help with that quite a bit. So let's hear just these instruments. So I have the motion in the strings and harp, as well as punctuations in the percussion section. So to support both of those things, I decided to have woodwinds on sustaining notes, essentially doubling the register of the strings. I have two flutes and two oboes doubling violin ones, with English horn in octave below. Clarinets and bassoons are below, doubling the viola and cello notes. I also have upper winds doubling the quarter note triplet gesture in measures 5 and 10. This line definitely needed support. It would have been lost if placed only in piano and vibraphone. So let's hear the woodwinds. Putting together strings, winds, and percussion, here's version two of this excerpt. Okay, so I made a third and final orchestration of this excerpt, and this time I wanted to incorporate brass. Adding in a full brass section will require careful balancing of the rest of the orchestra. It goes back to what I said just a bit ago about balancing forces. If you increase the density of one section of the orchestra, 
you need to decide how best to support it with the other sections if your ultimate goal is to have balance. But before I look at the brass, I'll start with strings. I've given the strings similar material to the last version, but now in eighth notes instead of sixteenth notes. The other main difference is that I expand the register quite a bit, especially in the high range. Even before writing the brass parts, I decided that I wanted to have strings with a bigger, more exciting sound, hopefully to match what I end up doing with the brass. This is especially true for the last two measures. So now the violins, violas, and celli are divided in half here, which allows me to thicken the voicing of the chords throughout a wider range. Notice that I'm now crescendoing to fortissimo, so overall you can anticipate this orchestration version to be much bigger and much louder. Here are the strings alone. I'll now add in the brass. I've decided to have trumpets and trombones muted with straight mutes. There's a certain type of energetic sound that I'm looking for, and muted brass gives me that energy level with less density and less intensity than unmuted brass. Even though I'm headed towards a fortissimo sound in the last measure, I still want to take into account the original piano dynamic marking in measure one. So muting the brass and also adding stopped horn notes brings some of that brassy, buzzy timbre without having such a heavy sound. So looking at the music here, you can see that I'm letting the brass, especially trumpets, but later all the brass instruments, respond to the string eighth notes that begin in measure one. Measures one through two feature a crescendo throughout the orchestra, and measure three is then punctuated by horns and trumpets as the diminuendo begins. That three measure phrase idea repeats, this time with trombones joining in and tuba punctuating the bass note. Finally, like the strings, I expand the range outward in the last few measures, and have the entire brass section building in intensity towards the fortissimo. Let's hear just the brass. Next we have woodwinds. There is a bit of overlap with the brass section in terms of roles within the texture for these wind instruments. Oboes function similarly to trumpets in the same register, specifically in this measure. I have low winds playing staccato eighth notes as well here. As was the case in the last orchestration of this excerpt, I needed to reinforce the quarter note triplet idea, so I have flutes, piccolo, oboes, and English horn playing that line in octaves, both in measure 5 and in measure 10. Other than a few clarinet and contrabassoon sustains, you can see that the entire wind section is mostly given short notes to reinforce the pulsating orchestral sound that I'm looking for. It's perhaps a bit different musically than the original piano idea, but the point here is to show the range of possibilities taking a simple two-staff piano idea and converting it to full orchestra. So here are the woodwinds alone. Next we have percussion. In terms of pitched percussion, I brought back the marimba, playing the same part basically from my first orchestration, as well as the same piano part from the previous two versions, although I've added an additional octave in the piano to try and cut through the orchestra more effectively. In terms of non-pitched percussion, I have suspended cymbal and crash cymbal accenting the important downbeats, as well as suspended cymbal with that same rolling crescendo from the previous orchestration. I also have bass drum crescendoing on a roll in the last measure. And timpani has a slightly more involved part over the previous version. Now it highlights the chord changes starting in measure 6, the alternation between F sharp and C. Here's percussion together. And finally, I want to spend a moment to look more closely at the harp part here. If I had just given the harp the same music as before, chances are it would have been covered up by a much louder, thicker orchestration. 
In these types of orchestral textures, there are only a few ways to have the harp be heard. Either really high notes at a loud dynamic, they might cut through, but another way is to have the harpist play a series of glissandi up and down. I mentioned how to notate this in my previous video on the harp. There are a few different ways. Here I notate a starting and ending note, as well as the pedal diagram right here. This diagram indicates all naturals except F sharp. So from left to right on the diagram, D, C, B, E, F sharp, G, and A. This scale works well for the entire passage, which makes the harpist's job much easier. They don't have to change the pedals at all between glissandi. The MIDI shown here actually shows two different MIDI tracks that I needed. When the left and right hands of the harp cross in measure 5, the only way I could think to make it work in the samples was to have two separate tracks. Also, if you're curious as to why the MIDI shows an F natural instead of F sharp, it's because I'm using the Berlin Harp True Pedal Patch, which allows you to set the pedaling here, and then play all of the white notes of the piano. It actually makes creating glissandi a lot easier. I think the new VSL Harp has a similar feature, and perhaps other Harp sample libraries as well. It's kind of a useful thing to have. So really my thought process for writing this harp part was to create a lot of sound crescendoing into the important downbeats. The more strings the harpist plays over a given period of time, the denser the sound will be. And that's what I wanted here. I also think that harp is one of those instruments that most listeners won't necessarily be able to pick out of a texture, but you'd know something was missing if you removed it entirely. So here's the harp part alone, and then I'll play the full version. So I'll look at one more example in this video, and then I'll look at three more in part two of this episode. Here's the third excerpt for piano. You might notice that the overall register is quite low. Even the climactic moment in measure eight is voiced fairly low. The first big decision I had to make before orchestrating was how to deal with that register. I could keep everything in the same register as the piano version. That might work if I were limiting myself to just a section of the orchestra, for instance just strings, or just strings and percussion, or some other subset of the orchestra. But if I were to use the entire orchestra and only stick to that range, I would worry about muddiness in the low register. After spending some time thinking about my options, I also decided that the best way to orchestrate specifically these last four measures would be to expand the register upwards and use the full orchestra. I'll exaggerate the syncopation between left and right hands and try to create a lively, almost bombastic orchestral timbre. As I did with excerpt number one, I'll add an additional staff to this piano score and show my process for not only expanding the register, but also adding new textures and orchestral effects. I'll begin with just the first three measures. So the first thing that I want to do is to expand the register up. The easiest way to do that would be to double this triad up the octave, like so. I'll refer to this process as making a short score. The term short score, at least how I use it, is usually between three and four staves, and it's meant to show all the different components of the full orchestration, like an orchestral reduction. Often a simple two-staff piano score is insufficient for showing all of the layers and textures that go into an orchestration, so here I'm showing three staves, although for these first three measures I don't need all three. So here you can see the expanded register upwards. The first three measures are fairly simple, but the next four is where it gets more interesting. Like the first three measures, I'll expand the register upwards, but I also think the texture needs something rhythmic to reinforce the syncopation between the left and right hands of the piano. So here's what I came up with. In the lower two staves, the only thing I've changed is to double the left hand in octaves. This will help reinforce the bass notes, 
In the upper staff, I've added new material that reinforces the dotted eighth note rhythms using 16th note syncopation. You can see here how the rhythms align with the staff below. I've also added a 16th note ascending line in both of the three eight measures. This line will be great for either wind, string, or perhaps mallet percussion runs. Let me play these four measures in piano. First, the original, and then what it sounds like with the added material. So in the last four measures, the material from the beginning returns now in E major. This time the left and right hands are alternating down and up beats, so the syncopation is maintained from the previous few measures. If you recall in excerpt two, there was a similar alternating left and right hand eighth note texture. And when I wanted to orchestrate that moment, I was cautious about letting the syncopation get too aggressive sounding. I don't need to worry about that here. In fact, I actually want to bring out that aggressive, almost jarring back and forth rhythmic element to this music. I used the word bombastic earlier, and I think that will definitely still apply. So in the expanded short score, all that I've done is to expand the voicing upwards. I suppose you might argue that this isn't accurately capturing the register of the original piano version, and that's fair. You'll always have to balance the accuracy of transcription versus navigating the stylistic translation going from piano to orchestra. In this case, I'm purposefully exaggerating the style and emotions of the piano version because I know to take advantage of the full orchestra, I need to use a more complete range. The only other thing that I've really changed here is I've added a low E in three different places. I think with all the busyness of this music, I needed just a bit more sense of downbeat from the low register, whether that ends up being basses, tuba, or contrabassoon. This just helps solidify the rhythmic foundation from which the syncopation is able to play off from. Okay, so I'll show the orchestration now. I really just took that short score and assigned the notes to various instruments. Here are the woodwinds first. You can see I've chosen to have reeds on the opening three measures. Then I have upper winds play the 16th note staccatos in measure four with clarinets and bassoons on the dotted eighths below and bass clarinet on the offbeat bass line. I have flutes and clarinets playing the ascending run up to measure six with oboes joining them the second time. And finally, the full woodwind section on the last four measures. Contra bassoon has the lowest octave downbeats with bass clarinet on the octave above with offbeats the rest of the section is filling out the chord, starting from top to bottom, piccolo, flutes one and two, then oboes, then clarinets, then English horn, then bassoons. Let's hear what this sounds like. In the brass, I open with two horns, two tenor trombones, and bass trombone. So they're essentially playing the same thing as the oboes and bassoons, voiced in a lower octave. In the next few measures, the brass isn't as involved, just some horns playing downbeat staccatos and crescendos in the 3-8 measures. I bring in trombones on the second 3-8 measure, leading us into the final bars. And here I bring in trumpets and the rest of the brass section. Tubas are doubling the contrabassoon in the low octave, trombones have the offbeats, and horns and trumpets are together playing the same thing as most of the woodwinds. So here's what the brass sound like alone. In the strings, I've added tremolos in the first few measures, sort of doubling the brass and wind notes in the low register but with tremolos instead of shorts. The tremolos help to establish an immediate sense of urgency and excitement. I think this really helps the continuity throughout these 11 measures. I have pizzicato celli and bass doubling bass clarinet in the next few measures with violins on sustained tremolos again. I also have violins doubling the flute and clarinet runs in the three eight measures. In the last four measures, the upper strings are divisi playing the same music as trumpets, horns, and upper winds. The celli are divided in octaves, playing along with the trombones, and the basses are doubling on that low tuba and contrabassoon part. So here are the strings. <laughs> 
finally, here's the percussion section. Definitely the most involved the percussion section has been in any of these excerpts thus far. I start very simply with a timpani roll. In the next section, I bring in xylophone doubling the flute staccatos and harp doubling the celli and bass pizzicatos. I also have a crash cymbal playing short notes on the offbeats and decided to have tempo blocks play 16th notes on that first 3-8 measure in a similar fashion to the woodwind and violin runs. That percussionist then switches to tambourine for the last section. I was looking for instruments here that have a lot of high-frequency energy with a relatively short ring time. Tambourine and also snare drum worked well here on the offbeats, with bass drum reinforcing the strong beats. Notice also that I'm not going crazy with harp here. I want to keep the clarity of the orchestra intact, so unlike the previous excerpt, I don't want a lot of density throughout, which is what I would get with a glissando. So I'm just keeping them on those strong beats in the low octave with bass drum, tuba, contrabassoon, and basses. Let's hear these instruments on their own. So let's listen to the full version. I'll show the MIDI this time. This one was a lot of fun to compose and also to mock up with samples. And once again, if you're interested in actually having these MIDI files or notation files, there's a link to my Patreon page in the description box below. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll be releasing part two of this episode shortly with three more excerpts to get through. See you next time.